Hi, and welcome back to LAST 201, Popular Culture in Latin America, with me, John Beasley Murray. So today we're going to be talking about food and drink. I'm mainly going to be talking about food. We might want to think how things might change, or what we might want to add if we were to talk about drink as well. We'll be talking, or I'll be talking mostly about sort of theoretical, general relationship between food and culture. I'll also be saying a little bit about the specific history, political and cultural history of food and food production in Latin America. And then talking briefly about these two texts, Rosario Castellanos' Cooking Lesson and Marisa Brandt's Zapatista Corn. But we'll talk first about food and culture in broad and general terms. <clears throat> food both marks and differentiates specific cultures and also helps to define and delineate culture itself. In other words, um, food has got an integral relation, I want to suggest, with the, the idea of culture and also with the possibility and practice of culture. But it also, uh, it, it also marks and identifies particular cultures. In other words, it also divides up or separates particular cultures and helps us to identify them, even though we'll see that the borders between food cultures are always fluid, indistinct, uh, and hybrid at the same time. It can also be felt like one of the most basic markers of difference and identity. So we want to look at that tension or, or contradiction as well. Now the concept of culture itself originally comes from agriculture, as I think I've mentioned uh, in previous weeks, where it referred to an intervention into natural pro processes, the act of tending, cultivating, um, ensuring that things ripened, uh, ensuring that um, livestock, for instance, fattened, and so on and so forth. It was not until the 18th century that culture gained its current, perhaps more abstract meaning um, to refer to other forms of intervention or other forms of um, growth or progress or supposed growth or supposed uh, tending or cultivating. Um, but the invention of agriculture to stick with culture as agriculture as opposed to hunting and gathering, in other words, um, when you uh, sow and harvest in uh, crops, um, is also seen often as a key social trans transformation, encouraging the establishment of settled communities because you want to, at the very least, return to and, and most likely stay with the sites of, of agriculture. In other words, uh, it's a point at which um, humans started to uh, settle down and establish uh, communities that had a sort of territorial or spatial presence. And this link between culture and settlement it may remind us or is underlined by the fact that culture the word culture and colonization in English also share, and in Spanish, also share an etymological root. They both originally derive from the Latin word colore, meaning variously to plow, to cultivate, but also to inhabit and to nurture, and interestingly to worship as well. So this notion of sort of ritual belief also seems to be sewn into this root word that gives us both of these two um, meanings, both of these two signifiers at the moment, culture and colonization. So there's a link between modes and forms or structures of food production and both A, a sense of improvement or progress, and B, the establishment of territorial affiliations and the division of space through concepts of possession and belonging. To whom does particular land belong? To whom does um, the items on it? And there's a whole history of uh, common land and followed by enclosure, which um, 
it's sometimes seen as the beginning of uh, of capitalism, um, but in some ways continues on to the present. The ways in which we process or transform the basic elements of foodstuffs, the the plants, again the the livestock and so on, the 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 process that is involved in this nurturing and and cultivation and processing and preparing also helps to establish a series of fundamental conceptual oppositions that frame our knowledge and understanding of the world around us. In other words, the relationship between food and culture is not just that of material or social, sociological, let alone biological support. Um, uh, it also gives us a way of, of, of thinking and interpreting society and the relationship between the social and the natural, for instance. In fact, the groundbreaking French anthropologist Claude Levi Strauss in the first half of the 20th century, he titled one part of his extensive study of Amerindian myths and belief system, The Raw and the Cooked, uh, arguing that this differentiation between raw and cooked, which is all about the way in which food is prepared for consumption, is a characteristic of culture. Cooking brings about the cultural transformation of, of the raw. And Levi Strauss is also a founder of the intellectual movement or, or way of thinking that went on to be called structuralism. And uh, he emphasized these often binary divisions or binary structures, uh, sometimes conscious but more often unconscious, through which we interpret and understand um, what we're doing and and the world around us. So just think, for instance, about the ways in which the language of food and, and food preparation and, and consumption permeates and proliferates through our everyday speech. Think of the verbs that we use in so many different contexts, not simply anymore the context of, of food, hunting and planting, sowing, tending, husbanding, reaping, harvesting, butchering, cooking. Um, you know, we can now think of, I don't know, butchering language, uh, cooking the books, uh, simmering with anger, uh, relishing a particular emotion, for instance, devouring, um, devouring a book, digesting an idea, and so on and so forth. All of these provide uh, are examples of images and metaphors that are drawn from or that are alluding to the various stages of food production and consumption and and which have which are everywhere in our everyday discourse even if we don't recognize necessarily or stop to think very often about uh, where this language or where this discourse originally comes from so if napoleon famously said that an army marches on its stomach we might Want to suggest or we also think of our stomachs as much as with our brains you know, the process of uh, cognition and, and recognition analysis uh, are all often um, bodily visceral corporeal processes as much as they are intellectual or mental processes and, and draw on our experience of the way in which our, we feed ourselves to to sustain uh, everyday life. In short, food is on the one hand obviously biological. We all need to eat to survive, um, to stave off mortality. Uh, it's not just a way of life, and someone says the way of life. There's something about, you know, something very general and essentially universal uh, there. Um, but it's also uh, specific. It is the material support of culture. Patterns of food cultivation, processing of consumption, you know, the ways, as I say, whether in which land is, uh, is, is held in common or is uh, divided up and, and enclosed, uh, the ways in which um, what grows on the land or the animals that are raised on the land are prepared and then consumed, uh, the ways in which um, we gather, for instance, uh, to eat collectively or in groups, 
all of these uh, enable, support particular cultural and social superstructures and traditions, um, the family or uh, modes of interacting beyond the family in the public sphere, restaurants and so on and so forth, modes of communal eating, feasts, uh, and so on and so forth. And then, and then finally, not only is food biological, is food a sort of material support establishing certain um, uh, patterns and enabling uh, certain ways of pattern making, it also more perhaps directly is symbolic. It's a means in which we establish conceptual and epistemological distinctions, providing ways uh, to think and uh, analyze and rationalize, perhaps. Within any given society, as well as between them, uh, food has both organized and been organized along lines of specific divisions of labor. Who does uh, what is um, one of the uh, basic um, ways in which our relationship to food is, is, is differentiated depending on the particular uh, place that we have in society and vice versa. Our place in society is in part determined by our relationship to the whole um, business of food production. So for instance, the vision between those who hunt and those who gather in hunter-gathering society, those who farm on the one hand, and those who prepare, those who process, or those who cook, those who sell food and those who serve it, and so on. These are all <coughs> quite fundamental uh, divisions of uh, social roles which may be more or less codified and uh, often give rise to and or map onto hierarchies of gender, for instance, of class, of race, as well as uh, enabling or giving rise to or drawing on regional and international hierarchies. Where does our food get, get produced? What kinds of food um, gets produced there? Um, and where does it get imported? Where does it get uh, processed and, and uh, refined, for instance? And not to mention that the food we eat and how we eat it also helps mark our social status. There are types of food, types of cooking that are um, associated with particular social classes, um, <coughs> uh, particular groups or, or social subgroups, for instance. So food, culture, and this nexus between food and culture, or perhaps we should put it in this plural, foods, cultures, are uh, everyday and habitual. And so taken for granted often and easily overlooked. Again, precisely because uh, food, uh, eating, preparing food is a biological necessity and seems to be driven by, or can seem to be driven by instinct, um, hunger, thirst, if we think of drink, um, we can uh, seem to, we can naturalize it. Um, whereas, in fact, I'm asking you uh, to think about this relationship in a little bit more complex uh, manner. And yet at the same time as being taken for granted and easily overlooked, it is also often visible and performative. We, we do usually gather to eat again, either within the household or out, outside it, uh, on special occasions, uh, food is, is, and drink are amongst, amongst the sort of social lubricants um, or excuses or occasions uh, for, for gathering in more or less ritual manners. And we watch each other eat and food consumption is often spectacular, right? You dress up, perhaps, on particular occasions, again, for a feast or for dinner or for um, or, or, or to go out uh, to eat, for instance. So there is that notion that uh, when we eat, we're also aware of how we are seen, how we present ourselves and the whole sort of set of manners and, and customs and so on are all about presenting oneself in particular ways in the act of, uh, of eating. So it is both natural and everyday, but also often a site of some uh, 
uh, and social anxiety of uh, attention to uh, establishing um, the proper norms of behavior. And uh, food cultures are also, are also prime markers of difference, simply of nomenclature, right? The ways in which we, the words we use for food or particular foods can help to identify ourselves. If we say, you know, scone or scone, for instance, uh, pop or soda, um, the many different words for, I don't know, a popcorn in Spanish through Latin America, um, they, they sort of, even if we may be eating the same things, um, the way in which we eat or the way in which we talk about uh, eating uh, can differentiate us in, in many different ways, even as foods are amongst the most uh, portable or traditionally portable of, um, of uh, raw materials or, or commodities and quickly travel and are incorporated or assimilated in new locations, precisely perhaps because um, food or eating is is repeated so often. We eat a couple of times, we eat three times uh, or three times a day, perhaps. And so that offers a sort of um, possibility for variability and quite quickly uh, taking up new patterns and behaviors of, uh, of consumption and, and production of food stuff. So let's talk about food and culture in Latin America, uh, specifically the sort of political history, if you like, political cultural history of, of food uh, in the region. And uh, we can talk about the way in which food was a vital element in the so-called Colombian exchange. So this is uh, the notion that, uh, especially in the early years, the early decades and um, centuries following 1492 and um, the European discovery of, of Latin America, um, there is a global transfer of all sorts of things, but uh, not least plants, animals, microorganisms, diseases, uh, in which, which transform not only the so-called new world, uh, but also the old world. And, and food or foodstuffs were a, a, a vital part of this uh, series of exchanges. By exchanges, obviously, they're not necessarily equal exchanges. Um, in many ways, uh, they set the pattern for a whole history of unequal exchange. But I want to emphasize that they transformed the colonial powers as much as uh, they transformed the uh, colonized um, cultures and, and civilizations of the of the new world so for instance potatoes and corn tomatoes coffee chocolate are all now inextricably part of the cuisine and lifestyle of european countries i mean imagine i don't know italian cuisine and cooking without tomatoes for instance or um European modes of socialization without coffee and a whole history of coffee houses or I don't know, eating but uh, without potatoes or chocolate as sign of, of luxury and a certain sort of decadence. These are all indelibly now um, part of what I imagine to be you know, Western, or often particularized Western cultural identities. And yet they're all new world imports. They didn't exist in, in Europe, in the old world, until until the 16th century or onwards. And, and these are not simply natural raw materials. So uh, in, in this transfer, what's being transferred also is also forms of, of technology or the results of often uh, long periods of cultivation and transformation. Uh, corn is a good example for this. Over uh, hundreds and thousands of years, the uh, Aztecs, Mexica um, civilization uh, in what is now uh, Mexico um, had, had transformed and, and domesticated and uh, elaborated essentially uh, new forms of uh, foodstuff in their constant selection and, and reselection of um, the kinds of corn, for instance, that um, that seem most suitable and most productive for uh, consumption. So um, 
yes, the, the Colombian exchange was an exchange of objects, of things, uh, but it was also a cultural and technological series of transfers away uh, as well, which went both ways, of, of course. So that uh, cattle, for instance, chicken, pigs for pork, were domesticated uh, animals that were quickly introduced and adapted uh, to the new world, uh, transforming uh, culture and, and, and cuisine uh, up and down uh, the Americas and incorporated into into national and, and regional cultures, but if in, in new ways. Over time, or over many Latin American economies came to revolve around agricultural monocrops for the export uh, market. So that's the setting aside of, um, of, of large amounts of land for uh, agricultural products um, desired or valuable in, uh, in, the, in the colonial center, uh, for instance. Um, the crops in question varied. Uh, they could be sugar, for instance, in the Caribbean and, and Brazil uh, for much of the colonial period and afterwards and to this day, uh, coffee, bananas, uh, beef, in somewhere like uh, Argentina, for instance, um, these days soy in the southern cone in Argentina and, and Paraguay. Um, so uh, there's an international division of labor. There is um, an export economies which became, for instance, increasingly dependent on uh, the fluctuations in the prices for these uh, commodified uh, foodstuffs raw materials um, that uh, were the product of uh, labor in, in Latin America. And agriculture was increasingly mechanized and industrialized, often controlled by foreign corporations who came to have outside political clout. Perhaps the whole history of so-called banana republics is the most infamous and so for instance the way in which in 1954 in Guatemala the CIA uh, orchestrated a coup against the democratic regime in that country on behalf of United Fruit on behalf of a US based uh, transnational corporation which owned immense tracts of land uh, in Guatemala which were devoted to uh, banana farming or devoted to the possibility of, of banana farming. Um, uh, many of the banana plantations. Um, there was also lots of land left uh, idle. The government proposed a redistribution uh, of that land and um, United uh, Fruit called foul, protested and persuaded the US administration to overthrow uh, the government. So food very directly um, has been political uh, for many years, uh, for many uh, decades, if not centuries, in the region. Uh, in other ways, food in Latin America is a marker of both tradition and modernity, difference and commonality, private and public, pride perhaps, and also um, humiliation. I mean by that, that um, uh, the food is often seen as something that is handed down uh, through popular culture as a mode of, of popular culture that is uh, uh, different from um, the kinds of practices and customs of uh, dominant powers. So a site perhaps of a certain form of resistance or something that or modes of being or modes of, of acting that dominant powers uh, didn't fully uh, incorporate. Uh, at the same time, uh, food, as a, especially when there's a lack of access to it, or when it is appropriated, or when um, uh, it is the, the cause of, uh, or the excuse uh, for different forms of intervention, uh, can also be the sites or the reasons for forms of uh, humiliation. People often talk about nowadays about food security and food sovereignty. Um, the notion that um, 
countries and, and cultures need to have more political control of the kind of food production and the structures of uh, food processing that exist within a particular territory. In the 20th century, the food landscape was transformed both by new forms of globalization. It's not that globalization is itself new, but new forms of globalization uh, enabled uh, major changes. Uh, for instance, the invention of refrigeration and re refrigerated uh, transport, um, the ways in which the so-called green revolution of the 1960s, uh, the food landscape was also transformed in the region by large scale urbanization the migration of uh, people from uh, the countryside to the towns and the cities and new forms of biotechnological innovation from uh, fertilizer uh, again associated with the green revolution in the 1960s to over the last 20 years or so things such as genetic modification which um, enable forms of labeling and even copywriting of what had previously thought to be um, common, what had previously thought to be sort of a shared natural and cultural um, treasury. And yet, despite all these changes in the last hundred years or so, food culture is also seen and often felt, again, quite viscerally, perhaps both for good and for ill, as a site of heritage and community as perhaps uh, resistant to change as a <laughs> again in both senses for good or for ill um, as perhaps the the last thing that changes that needs to be changed uh, and also as modes of resistance or forms of resistance or practices that uh, uh, resist changes that come from outside so let's look uh, briefly at uh, Rosario Castellanos, um, Mexican author, uh, and her short story, A Cooking Lesson. Uh, she uh, highlights the gender division of labor and space, the way in which women are consigned to the kitchen and also to the bedroom. She highlights the sort of the material consequences or the material forms of um, a gendered uh, subju subjugation, what I might call uh, patriarchy, attending to both the material qualities of food and food preparation, as well as to their symbolic overtones, the relationship between different forms of desire, different forms of uh, hunger, different forms of conformity. So cooking here is both enforced isolation and separation. We have essentially a monologue from a woman who feels imprisoned in her kitchen, uh, imprisoned in as a newlywed in, in her marriage, imprisoned in a social role, unable perhaps to communicate, unable to take part in the same way in the public sphere, even though her activity in the kitchen enables forms of socialization. And um, and yet that isolation is itself inherently social. She asks, how could one carry out such an arduous task without the cooperation of society of all history? Cooperation, I think here is a rather ironic sense, the ways in which um, these forms of separation, these modes of division, these hierarchization, these, um, these forms of dominance, uh, have a long history, are somehow ingrained and naturalized in many ways. Cooking here provides, I think, a double lesson. Um, there's a sort of play on, on words uh, here. Uh, on the one hand, it is. It's training in submission to pra patriarchy. As she says, I transform myself into a society matron who gives luncheons and dinners for her husband's friends. She's uh, being taught this new and rather unwelcome role. This is, she realizes, the winding path that my grandmothers took, the humble ones 
the ones who didn't open their mouths except to say yes. And I think it's important here also that you know this is a uh, woman who is uh, portrayed as a modern woman, as a middle class woman, um, and she is realizing that uh, she's not as perhaps privileged as she might have thought she once was. And in fact, that process of realization is, I think, the other sense that this is a lesson. This is a lesson in some ways in solidarity and recognition that she, she the, is not so different from her um, mother, from her grandmothers and so on. Um, that she is part of a group. She's part of a sisterhood, I suppose. And it, this provides her to, with a chance to reflect and learn about the ways of that patriarchy. In other words, in some ways, her enforced isolation and separation also inadvertently maybe gives her tools for thinking, for recognition, for analysis, and rebellion, if maybe muted. And so we've got a somewhat ambivalent conclusion. She is um, learning how to, you know, her path to uh, take up uh, an assigned role. And she is also learning the ways in which social roles are assigned. She's learning um, to be critical. She's learning a sort of um, a vocabulary for understanding the ways in which um, masculine domination uh, works. And, and hence we have this amb ambivalence, I think it's sort of shot all the way throughout, but also in a sort of inconclusive inclusion, inconclusive conclusion in which she says, and yet, that's perhaps opening up to some possibility of some kind of less muted rebellion, not just in this essentially interior monologue represented by the story itself, which we read, which we're reading as a, a published text, which we're reading as something which is no longer interior, which we're reading as a form of literate or literary process, uh, literary or, or literate protest against the way in which food and fo food culture um, has enforced and legitimated or seemed to legitimate uh, certain social hierarchies. Marisa Brandt's uh, Zapatista Corn, a rather different text, um, an academic anthropological uh, article, also, however, uh, very interested in uh, the m ways of power and especially international um, inequality are expressed uh, through food and through food production. She's interested in the nexus of um, uh, science and uh, technology with food in the spe specific context of the Zapatista rebellion, the Ejército Zapatista um, the Liberación Nacional, a movement that occupies an ambivalent space. Perhaps uh, there's something of the ambivalence that we also see in Castellanos' um, piece. Uh, in the first place, in that the Zapatista movement was both an antagonist, or is both an antagonist and a beneficiary of global translation and dissemination. And so Brandt is interested in that um, multifacetedness of, um, of of corn and of global agricultural um, exchange. The Zapatista um, movement arising in opposition to the North American Free Trade Agreement, NAFTA in the mid-1990s. It claims an attachment to territory and local difference uh, to its rootedness uh, in the indigenous communities and uh, attachment to the land and to the soil, while also putting technologies such as the internet to work to construct networks of international solidarity. So she's interested in the ways in which <coughs> these networks of international solidarity interact with, in often complex ways, uh, these uh, this particular um, local, national, but also local, regional, uh, movement of of protest and resistance. 
So we see a, a, a complex set of attitudes and strategies in the Zapatista movement's response to here the spread of genetically modified corn, against which the state itself has provided little protection. I think that's interesting that the notion that um, genetically modified corn could not be legislated out of the Mexican market, and so the Zapatistas are uh, forced to resort to other methods, other strategies, other technologies for um, thinking about, dealing with, uh, confronting, and offering alternative to uh, the the spread of um, forms of, of, of corn from you know, international, multinational, such as Monsanto. So, as I say, she shows a set of exchanges and negotiations between the Zapatista community on the one hand and transnational activists on the one hand, on the other hand, who um, brought, bring, for instance, the idea of a seed bank, of uh, collecting, classifying, cataloging uh, corn types, um, uh, in which they take up some of these ideas and then, as she says, sort of quietly leaves other of these ideas behind. Uh, a negotiation between different forms of technology, discourse, different ways of talking about food in its new states and food transformations, and different forms perhaps also of political understanding, in which we see the Zapatistas selectively innovate and adapt new technologies in order both to pre preserve their autonomy and to extend their global reach. So this is sort of dance, if you like, um, between um, tradition and resistance and change or transformation in which the Zapatistas uh, claim the right to decide on the forms of hyper-modernity or technology or science that um, they see as supporting their communal goals and reject those forms that they see as not doing so, as um, being able to choose between forms of, of, of global interconnectedness uh, that, again, they see as um, promoting solidarity and uh, justice and rejecting other forms of global interconnectedness uh, that don't. So she concludes with the notion that Zapatista corn offers the possibility of material participation in the enactment of a different kind of world. So in conclusion, well, we've barely even mentioned drink and we might want to think about how drink um, might complicate it or add to or extend some of these preliminary ideas that I've been trying to suggest from coffee to rum, water to Coca-Cola, ingested liquids of all sorts have also been sites of contestation and vectors of transformation. We can think about, I don't know, the water wars in Bolivia in the early 2000s, the question again of common ownership and enclosure, which uh, continues to be a site of um, struggle as much now as in the origins of, of capitalism. We can think of uh, notions of fair trade. We can think of questions of intoxication. We can think of the way in which particular drinks are identified with particular communities. Again, both um, geographically separate communities and also within particular uh, societies. But overall, food and drink, like popular culture as a whole, are sites of both resistance and change. In other words, they're dynamic and varied, multifaceted, both ordinary and special, or allowing for the opportunity for the marking of the special and fundamentally uh, unpredictable. If we really are what we eat, perhaps we should pay more attention to what is on our plate and how it gets there.